Thank you for coming for English breakfast tea. Absolute pleasure, because Jules. Thank you for having me. Of course. And because you're English, we have to have English breakfast. Yeah, of course just, we do. It feels right, and it's my favourite kind of tea. Would you mind taking us back a little bit, uh, well, well, to the beginning of of your existence and oh, being really being Jules I'm quite old that could take some time <laughs> give us a bite-sized piece <laughs> okay well yes I'm English I was I was born in in England and I spent most of my life um, or a big chunk of my life in London I was I was born sort of southeast of London and grew up on the coast the Kent coast but when I was fresh out of uni I moved to London I lived in London for 15 years before I moved to Australia and I've now been in Australia for 20 years. Do the math and you can work out how old I am. You know, about 26. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> and so what was, what was the calling for you to this interior styling world, magazines and, well now television, but what was, what was the call to the creative world? Well, it, it was an interesting path, okay, because my background is in magazine publishing. Yeah. I, I never trained as an interior designer. My background is as a journalist and an editor. And when I first moved to Australia 20 years ago, I was editing food magazines. That was my big passion. Mm -hmm. I started off many years ago in London in the fashion world, in the crazy world of PR actually, fashion mm -hmm. PR. And then I moved into magazine publishing in the UK. And then that's what brought me to Australia because Australia has always been and still is the best place in the world for lifestyle magazines. Did you know that? We produce the magazines here that the rest of the world admires and, and looks to. Right. Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah, so what makes us so good? Look, that, that's a huge question and it would probably take a long time to answer properly, but basically we have a resourcefulness here that's always made our magazines shine basically on the smell of an oily rag. Right. Because we don't have and never have had vast budgets here for publishing, but what we do have is that amazing abundant light out there yeah. and this incredible landscape and we put it to good use and our magazines, our food magazines, our travel magazines, our home magazines have always absolutely shone mm. as a result. Right. And yeah, I used to sit at my desk over in London back in the 90s and I would get every copy of Gourmet Traveller and Belle and Vogue Living and Vogue Entertaining that existed in those days and I would think, oh man, I've got to get myself to Australia. Really? Mm. Took me a long time to get here, but I finally made it in 1999. What brought all of that together? What, how did the stars align and, and bring you here? I was at a bit of a crossroads in my life. My mother had passed away several years before, which had affected me quite deeply. Mm. And I felt like I needed to make some changes in my life. I'd also just come out of a long-term relationship. So I think I was probably ready for a big challenge. Mm. And I knew I wanted to go overseas. Wasn't quite sure where. I mean, I, I had been to Australia many times and loved it. I also had an, uh, a job offer from the United States. I could go to the States and, and work in publishing. I was a bit torn, to be honest with you. Keeping a very long story short, the stars aligned to get me to Australia. Mm -hmm. And I accepted a job here in mm -hmm. publishing. And I thought I'd probably be here for 12 months two years if I was lucky, mm. here I am. Mm. 20 years this year, 20 years in October. Well, we love Fully paid up member you. of the country now, passport holding wow. Australian citizen. Congratulations. <laughs> we are more than <laughs> happy you. to have you, for yeah, sure. Well, I'm very happy to be here. And you have brought such an essence to the industry. You are so well loved and received and, and respected. Oh, thank you. There's something about you that's so um, refined and <sighs> believable I think you bring an honesty to to what you say and it, because to me now that I've built a home mm -hmm. and I say a home because a house is a house but a home is a home absolutely I believe that home is where your heart is home is what what you make it sure and it's what happens on the inside of this place that yeah. matters the most to me and to our family and I want people when they come to my home to feel welcome to feel warm to that it's a safe mm. space that we can have a cup of tea and a chat and yeah. it, it's a it's a friendly place for people to feel a belonging that's what we wanted to create in this place and a lot of the reason why i wanted to have tea with jewels here even though there's a camera in your face and <laughs> lights shining on us yeah. right now but you don't even notice that do you yeah I, there's something about a home that that yeah has all of that going Absolutely. on in your family and your children and all of that 
Do you, I feel like you have sort of articulated that over your time as an editor yes. and watching you on television. I mean, look, you've put it very well. I mean, a house is a house, but a home is a home and the two things are entirely different. Yeah. And, you know, it can actually take a long time to make a home. Mm. You know, a home doesn't necessarily just happen overnight. Sometimes it can take years to turn a house into a home. And that might sound like the ultimate cliche, but I really believe it's true. Look, I guess I'm in a very lucky position because I've edited some of the world's most beautiful magazines, mm. certainly some of Australia's most beautiful magazines. You know, I'm very fortunate to have been the editor of Bell. I've been the editor of Vogue Living. I've also been the editor of Vogue Entertaining back, back in the day. But certainly editing Bell and Vogue Living means that I've had access to some of the world's most incredible homes. Mm. You know, some of the most architectural homes you've ever seen yeah. around the world. You know, and I was lucky enough for 10 years to travel to Milan every April to Design Week and get to meet some of, you know, the most astonishing names in design. Mm. So I've had a very, very lucky journey through that very sophisticated, high-end world of design. But I've also been doing The Block for nearly a decade. Mm -hmm. And now I co-host a show for Foxtel as well, which keeps me real. Mm. is the only way I can put it, because it makes me aware of those high-end trends that I've been exposed to, what people really do with them, the ones that they carry into their own lives, the way it sort of filters down and people actually use that information. Mm. You know, it's, it sounds like another cliche to say, you know, I've actually been there on the tools. You know, maybe I'm not actually there on the tools physically, but I'm there at the very, very sharp end mm. of the build, seeing how Australians make homes. Right. how they want to live mm. and I think it's given me a very privileged overview of the interior design world the renovation world in this country do you know what I've learned it's kind of a bit like fashion when you understand how something is made the materials that it's been made with where it's been made um, how it fits how it feels I remember when I you know was able to buy my first designer handbag and it was just a feeling it was like this feels what was so it nice. oh, what was it what did you buy Celine oh, a Celine yeah. bag good choice and it's beautiful and I still have it and it's like mm. my prized possession it's it's but it is a is hard world it. to straddle yes the key you is are mixing right. it you are right and that's, yep. that's what I believe in I mean I guess Jules one of the really important things um, that I believe in and, and the older I get, the, the more I believe in it, is that homes should never be about trends. Yes. I mean, that, that's a really odd thing for me to say as an ex-magazine editor, because as a magazine editor, you know, we trade in trends. That's what mags are about. What I believe personally is that your home has to be about you and what you love. Yep. And it doesn't matter whether the things you put in that home are on trend or not. Because mm -hmm. people always ask me, they say, oh, Neil, you know, what, what's on trend? You know, what color sofa should I have? What type of rug should I have? What color should I paint my walls? And what they mean is what's on trend. Mm. And I say, well, what colors do you like? Yeah. And they say, oh, well, you know, I like blue or I like green, but that's not on trend, is it? I say, it doesn't matter. Mm. It's what you wake up to yeah. every morning. It's got to be stuff that gives you joy. And I really believe that. And it's only when I think you start thinking like that and filling your house with things that give you joy and give you pleasure that it starts to become a home. I love that. It's, it's true. Yeah. And, and filling it with things that mean something to you. I mean, my, my home um, on the south coast of New South Wales is stuffed full of memories. Hmm. The you know, things that my partner David and I, you know, we've been together for 16 years, we've traveled extensively. And whenever we travel, we always buy something for the home, always. Whether it's something that we can put on a table or whether it's something that we're gonna have on the wall, it's always something for the home mm -hmm. because we love having those memories around us. Mm. That's beautiful. Mm. And that's what makes it yours. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Speaking of home, if we can go back to how you grew up in your home, you mentioned before about your mother, how yeah. you, you've lost your mother and that was deeply hard, which mm. I can't even imagine. What was it like in your family growing up? Look, I think I had a pretty ordinary childhood, if, if there is such a thing. I grew up on the south coast of England. I went to a, a boys' grammar school. We lived in a, a very nice house, a very, what would now be termed a very 70s house, because mm -hmm. guess what? It was the 70s. <laughs> um, and it was a house that was, I mean, my parents didn't build the house, but it was fairly new, I think, when we, when we bought it. My father died when I was very young. So I guess I had a very um, unusual 
childhood, adolescence, mm. um, in that respect, because my father sadly passed away when I was just 14. Oh, wow. So myself and my two brothers were very much brought up by our mother. So mum mm. became parents, you know? But that said, I, I never felt that we wanted for anything or mm. missed anything. I, I feel that I had a very full childhood. I feel that I had every everything I needed and wanted, and I certainly was loved. I guess I was always, to an extent, an outsider. I, I probably knew that I was gay from a very early age, but mm. didn't realize. I just saw that in terms of being an outsider. Right, um, like what, around about what age? Oh, probably, oh gosh, if I'm honest, probably from very early teens, from, from when adolescence kicked in. Yeah. I'd say probably, probably around about the time my father passed, mm -hmm. um, maybe even a bit younger, so 12, 13, that kind of age. Mm. And even though you, you sort of don't probably at that age really understand, or then, I mean, I think we're a lot more sophisticated now, mm. um, but this, don't forget, is we're talking the early 70s. Yeah. Probably didn't really understand what was different about me. I mm. just knew something was different. Right. And I think other kids pick up on that too. Did you experience yes, did. some hardship? Yeah, I did, yeah, mm. a bit. You know, I can't sit here and, and say, God, I had a terrible childhood mm. and I was bullied at school and all that stuff because it would be wrong of me to say that because there are other kids out there who did it a lot tougher than I did. But certainly as an outsider, you are aware that you are different to the other kids. Mm. Did you know anybody else that was in the same boat as you? It's funny how you gravitate towards mm. the same kindred spirits. Yeah. And it wasn't until many years later that we, we realized that we were all the same. Right. Um, you certainly don't know it as, yeah. as 12, 13 year olds. But yes, I think you, you know, kindred spirits seek each other out. And so when did you identify, I suppose, that you were gay and that was... Um, when I went to university, mm -hmm. I think that was really like my sort of coming out in every sense of the word. <laughs> I, had, I had a ball at uni, I really did. I went to the University of Warwick in the English Midlands in the city of Coventry. And I think that was the first time in my life when I felt like I was surrounded by people that spoke my language. People that were into the same music as me and the mm. same bands and the same fashion and the same art and wow, it kind of blew my mind. Yeah. Um, and I, I suddenly felt that I'd found my tribe and it was nothing about, I'm not talking about sexuality, mm -hmm. I'm just talking about feeling that you belong. Yep, these are my people. That, these are my people. Yeah, like you said, you didn't feel like an outsider, you feel included. Mm. You feel like you're a part of what's absolutely. going on. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. I felt for the first time probably that I could really be me. What a great feeling. Mm. It's a long time ago now. It's hard, it's hard to remember, but I just do remember. Yes, I think that will stay with me for the rest of my life, that feeling of freedom. I've been talking a lot um, on this series of Tea with Jules about self-confidence and self-worth because mm. I, I feel like as humans we fluctuate between, oh, for sure. depending on the, the circumstance you're in and you know where life takes you, you, you mm. sort of, sometimes you feel really confident and very self-assured and other times you feel like you know nothing at all and you have to relearn everything. And you know what? It's a journey that never stops. Never stops. No. I think I need to embrace it more and just yeah. accept that that's what's going to happen. It's part of life. It really yeah. is. I mean, it, it, you know, it's that old truism that you'd never stop learning. It doesn't matter mm. how young you are or how old you are. You never stop learning. It, it's absolutely true. Yeah. And I think that that what you've just described, that feeling of sometimes being confident, sometimes not, that's also part of life. Have you ever felt like there's been a time in your life where you lost your confidence? Oh, so many. Yeah? So many times, yes. I mean, as a magazine editor, you know, you only have to have an issue that doesn't sell as well as the last issue and you suddenly start thinking, oh my God, is it me? Right. Is it me? You know, what? Well, yes. I mean, I, I think creative people can suffer that very, very badly. I agree with you. You know, it's, it's yeah. all tied up with ego and self-esteem and all yep. that stuff. And certainly, yes, there were times when I really doubted my abilities mm. and thought, you know, am I really up to this job? Mm. And certainly when I first moved to Australia, you know, the first couple of years when I felt like I was proving myself, you know, in a whole new country to a yeah. whole new industry. And then when I made the move into television, which is, is fairly recent, you know, even though I was sort of at a fairly advanced age, I was, you know, in my early 50s, you still go through that period of self-doubt. Mm. Like, am I good enough to do this? Yeah. How did you combat that? You just get on with it. Yeah, you just Seriously. do it. Yeah. There's no secret formula. I'm, I'm very much that kind of person that just thinks, mate, 
get over yourself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> stop wallowing in it just get on with it and do yep. it yep. get on with the job and do it the best you can do you think there's that element of um fake it till you make it that saying where you just put a smile on your dial and get on with it and yes whatever will be will be i think that's sometimes the only way to approach life yeah i mean look having having said that i guess I'm at an age now where I have done a lot in my life. I've got a lot of experience under my belt. So I'm less phased by certain situations because a lot of situations that face me now are situations that I have been in before to some extent. Okay, so you've learned from it. So I have and you, learned. you're applying what needs to be done now. Yeah. Yeah. But, but you know, every now and again, and it will probably happen until the day I die, mm -hmm. um, you know, there'll be something that pops up that you think, oh, damn. Um, Okay, this is a new one. Mm. Uh, okay, let me just go back into the memory bank yep. and find the right solution for this one. Because I believe in doing things afraid. Because I'm afraid. Probably, yeah, I, I'm 100% afraid 100% of the time. <laughs> I really? feel like I do a lot of things afraid. Like, but I've, what do you mean by afraid? Um, is it really fear? Maybe it is the, the confidence, the self-confidence, exactly what you were saying. Can I actually do this? Mm. Like, can I actually have Neil Whitaker sit on my couch in the house that I've built and have a, a conversation about life? Like, can I actually hold this space and, and do this and for anyone to care and be interested? And will Neil leave this situation and think, that was nice? <laughs> Yeah, well, do you know what I mean? Yes. Like th those things where you're like, oh, I'm a little bit afraid of this, okay. but I'm doing it okay. afraid. Okay, well, that's obviously the thing that spurs you on. That's what motivates you. Hmm. And I think I understand exactly where you're coming from because I, I do like to sort of push myself as well into situations. So I think I understand. Yeah. I think we're coming from a similar kind of place with that. Like, say, for example, how, how did the block come about for you? I was editing Bell magazine and I got a call from a casting agent who, were actually, who was actually looking for judges for a, a new show that Channel 9 was doing called Homemade. Mm -hmm. Not the block, Homemade. The block had been off air for a few years. It was sort of resting. It was in its hiatus period. But Julian Cress and David Barber, who were the creators of the block, had just come back to Australia after a few years in the States and they were doing a new renovation reality show called Homemade and they needed judges. And they asked me if I would screen test. I can remember the conversation so clearly. I was sitting in my office and I remember saying, oh, thank you so much for thinking of me, but no, I don't think it's me. Fortunately, I had the foresight to take the number and the name of the person that was calling me. Mm -hmm. Thank God I did. I put the phone down, and I think it was the days when you did have a phone on your desk. <laughs> yeah. I put the phone down, and I think I thought about it for all of 30 seconds and thought, you're a fool. Why would you not go and give that a go? Mm. Fear. Yeah. Fear. I'd never done television. Mm -hmm. So therefore there was a little voice in my head saying, oh no, 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 you've never done that, so why would you? Mm -hmm. So I called this person back and said, actually, yes, I will come along. I will come along for the audition. And I went along for the audition, Loved it, thoroughly enjoyed it, thought no more about it. Literally three months went by and then I got a call from Julian saying, we'd like to have you on board. So that was homemade. So I did that series in 20, 2009. Mm -hmm. It did reasonably well, but they didn't commission a second season. And then the following year, they said they were bringing the block back. Julian and David were bringing the block back and would I like to be part of the block? Mm -hmm. And I said, yes, of course. And here I am 13 seasons later. Unreal. Nine years and 13 seasons. Unreal. I have a similar story about my entry into television as you. I was happily going along my styling way. Got a call from MTV about a, sh a show they were doing a, a makeover show, mm. essentially. And exactly the same thing. I was like, um, I don't think you've got the right person because mm. I've never been on television before. Yeah. I don't know how to do this. Exact same thing. I went in for the audition and I was like, I've I don't know how to audition for TV. What do you mean? And did the whole thing and just be yourself. This is what I was getting to, and this is what this is just all I can ever say of that day. I was myself. I ca I don't know how to do anything else. I don't know how to be on TV. I don't know what no, no. that hat is to put on. To I just went You're in just there, you. did my did my thing, did what I would normally do. I think there's something so powerful in that. I try and bring that to my role as a judge on the block. I mm. definitely try and bring it to my role as, as the host on Love It or List It. But when I'm judging the block, you know, I know that half of Australia is probably gonna disagree with me. Mm. If I'm lucky, the other half might agree with me, mm. but I just have to tell it like it is. And you know, my opinions are 
genuine opinions and I try to make sure that they're constructive yeah. that if, if I criticize something or if I say I don't like something mm. I explain why I hope it's never just sort of an irrational dislike it's a constructive dislike or right. a constructive mm -hmm. criticism so there's value um, in it yes for them. but you know you, you don't win any friends from <laughs> being a judge on a reality show no. um, but oh, you do just have that. you just have to be yourself <laughs> that's right yeah you do that's right how do you go with being famous <laughs> mm, I don't really feel famous if you I'm don't. really honest I mean yes of course I do get recognized in certain places particularly in Melbourne mm -hmm. um, because Melbourne of course loves the block mm. you know anything that happens in in their city mm. so I yeah I get recognized and occasionally ask for a selfie mm -hmm. but that's as far as it goes oh god how corny does it sound if I say I don't think it's changed me but it hasn't changed me yeah I'm exactly the same person that I always was yeah hey look I'm incredibly grateful for all that kind of thing and, and to be to be doing what I'm doing at this stage in my life and my career I, I just think is such a gift it's so wonderful do you practice you just mentioned being grateful um, I know there's a lot of buzzwords going around you know like mindfulness and mm. meditation and do you have something like that a ritual or a belief or no not anymore but I've had plenty in the past right. um, I think I've probably learned every possible form of meditation going in in the past mm. and there was a period in my life back in the gosh what would it have been late 80s I think when I actually practiced Buddhism for several years right when I was still living in London and I've always had an incredible interest in Buddhist studies and Buddhism in general and, and meditation practices, all yeah. that kind of thing. And there have certainly been times in my life when it's helped me massively. At this precise moment in my life, no, I don't really have time for any of those things. I yeah. wish I did. Would you ever go back to it? Oh, yes, yeah. in a heartbeat, yeah. if I had a bit more time in my life. Mm -hmm. you know, I try and slot it in when I can, but yeah. at the moment it's not very often. Mm. Could you, in your own words, describe what the word success means to you? I guess success for me, mm, I think it's d definitely meant different things to me at different times in my life. Mm. I think success now at this stage in my life is definitely about feeling content. And I'm sorry if that, if that sounds a bit trite, but I really believe that. But that's because of the stage of life I'm at. I mean, there have been times in my life when I was much younger, when I marked success in terms of achievement, yep. in terms of financial reward, mm. in terms of the dollars that were going into my bank account. That was the markers of success. But now it's much more about feeling satisfied mm. creatively and it's feeling happy and contented with who I am and what I'm doing. Mm. I mean, I feel that I've had a wonderful career in publishing. I was in publishing for 27 years mm. before I stepped down from Vogue Living. I had my first publishing gig in 1990, stepped down from Vogue Living in 2017. So that was 27 years. Wow. And that was a highly successful career and I got to, to edit some wonderful magazines and launch some wonderful magazines in that time and I loved every minute. It was time to step down and I feel very fortunate that I was able to move sideways into a new television role. So now I'm, I'm, I'm not chasing that big sort of corporate gig. Yep. I'm not chasing the fantastic job title on the business card anymore. I'm much more focused on doing the things that bring me pleasure mm. and things that allow me to use the skills that I've acquired. Mm. And it's a, it's a different type of success. It's a much more mellow type of success. Mm. So basically, that's a very long-winded answer oh, to your I love question. That answer. <laughs> I'm yeah. never very good at giving short answers. I think at this stage in my life, success equals contentment. I don't think that sounds trite at all. I think that's the goal. Mm. I think there is something so beautiful yeah. about being content with where you are and what you've yeah. got. So I think that's the goal. Mm. I think that's a beautiful, amazing answer. Well, it's it's certainly. It's certainly my answer now, sitting where I'm sitting. As I yeah. say, it might have been a different answer 10 years ago, 20 years ago, but it's, it's the answer now, contentment. I love it. Yeah. I love it. Can we talk about your beautiful David? Yes, we can. <laughs> you guys have been together for a long time. 16 years, Jules. Well done. That is no mean feat. <laughs> yeah. Any relationship. And they do say sometimes that gay years are like dog years, so. <laughs> <laughs> that means we've been together for about a century and a bit, I think. Well done. I mean, there's no secret sauce. I understand that, you know, it's all, it's time and there's so, there's, there's so much to a relationship that mm. makes it 
um, work. What are, what are some of the things that make you guys work? I just think it's giving each other space. There's no secret formula. I'd yeah. love to sit here and say, yeah. oh, well, our formula is this, yeah. but there's not. Mm. I mean, I think it's accepting each other's differences. It's, it's celebrating each other's similarities, but accepting that there are also differences. Of course there are. It's learning to live with those differences and learning to understand, I think, what makes each other tick. Certainly giving each other space listening is really important mm, mm. we so often in life don't find time to really listen properly and to the hearing. people that matter to us and hear yes. what they're saying to us yes just being there for each other Agreed. you know you don't run away when things get bad you don't you might run for cover but mm. you don't run away oh, that's a good one so run for cover don't run away i love that run for cover i just made that up <laughs> that's but I mean, great yeah, you don't run for, you don't run away but you might run for cover it's so inspiring to see and this is my last question for you and it's a bit of a big one if you could leave a legacy behind for your life what would you want to be remembered for jules that is a very big question i think i would just like to be remembered for being you know the best i could be <laughs> and for being kind I will cry right now. Mm -hmm. Respect is something that has always been very important to me all through my career from the early days and it's as important now as it was and it's something that you don't find very often and I'd like people to, to think that. Uh, yeah, that I was the best person I could be and I don't just mean that professionally, I mean with the people that surround me. Yeah. Now I'm getting emotional. <sighs> <laughs> How did you get that out of me? But it, it's true. You know, I, I could sit here and say, you know, I would love to be remembered for the magazines I edited, for the television shows I've created. But actually, no, no, I'd much rather be remembered for me, for being a good person, for being someone who cared about the people in my life and for doing the best I could for those human beings and my dogs. Of course, your children. Yes, I care hugely about those too being kind. Kind to everyone. Yep. Kindness. There ain't enough kindness in this world anymore. Should be printed on my forehead. Just be kind. <laughs> Just be kind. kind. Just be kind. I am all for the kindness. I am so glad you came today. Thank you. I've loved every minute too. Oh, I'm so glad. The and tea's gone cold, tea's but we've had a great chat. It's so cold. I know. We need like a thermos. <laughs> It's it cold. still tastes good though, Jules. Okay, good. Um, no, I've loved every minute of sitting here chatting to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for sharing your heart and mm. your stories. I really appreciate it. Thank you.